So this is our title. Feed additives. When, why, and which one. And so here's our program. No more Trump slides. We're going right down to business. All business in this talk here. With a little bit of luck, we'll get you done about five or six minutes early because I started five or six minutes early as far as that goes, which is really unusual on a program. So away we go. So we're going to talk about a feed additives and status. Microtoxin binders, I thought I'd keep that in because I talked to a, a colleague from Tennessee and they said some farmers are chopping corn sides really late, really wet, and you had some real challenges. And so when you got late corn sides and wet corn sides, microtoxins can be a real risk. We'll put that in there and I'm not sure we'll have much time to spend on DFAs, but it's a new kid on the block again. And so I think it's useful to come to dairy meetings with new stuff that maybe you haven't heard before other than uh, transition cows and colostrum. So here's why we're gonna talk about it today. Feed margins are tight, and my dairymen are pulling additives out. They said, banker says no, my wife says no, everything costs a nickel or 10, 12, 14 cents, and that all adds up, I'm milking 100 cows or 1,000 cows. Some of these can get quite expensive, usually if it's under 10 cents, my guys will look at them very carefully. I hope we don't use this to cover up poor management, that's a very bad reason for using uh, an additive, and this is why you're using it right here. And that comes from a veterinarian at the uh, University of Pennsylvania Vet School. <coughs> so you might ask, well, what are my colleagues doing in the United States? Here's a brand new survey. Forge Jeremy does a market survey every year. This is a 2018 market survey. I just got it about a month ago, just in time to get into Liz's uh, presentation here. So in 2018, you can see this is what we're doing. Buffers were down about 4%. Yeast culture was down about 3%. Remens the stays static. I don't think that's true. Every Tennessee dairy farmer should be feeding a Romensin, period. Enough said. Uh, here's a new kid on the block, probiotics, about 11%. That surprises me. Binders, 24%. We are getting this close to routinely recommend binders across the board to Illinois dairy farmers. What? Yeah, I'm sorry. I said we're, we're getting this close to recommending microtoxin binders routinely in dairy rations. 24-7, 365. Just because we have bunkers, we have pits, we have wet byproduct feeds, we have risks. We have risks. And I look at my pig people, my chicken people, and they have no time. They have no time for microtoxins because it really screws up feed efficiency. They just have to make sure these birds are doing well. And you can look at the rest of them at your leisure. So that's, that's what the competition, if you want to call Horge Dairyman Reader. Who is the Horge Dairyman Reader? It's whoever subscribes to Horge Dairyman. So heavily influenced by Wisconsin, Minnesota, New York, and Pennsylvania. California, Mexico, Arizona doesn't influence as much because there's not many dairy farmers out there. So they don't buy us in that direction. Uh, away we go. What about side inoculants? We're a big fan of it. You'll see it pop up here later. We'll do some voting. You can see about a third of the farmers in that survey, the way I calculated, we're using side inoculants. And it's not a cheap investment. On average, $6,000. Now you can see why people are saying, well, eh, maybe we, Martha, we won't spend inoculant. What surprised me is here's what they were using. And which is, the, which, which is the easiest crop up here to ferment? What's by far the easiest crop to ferment? Corn silage. And the toughest one is high moisture corn. Look at, and we have something called lactobacillus buchneri that's screaming at you as a silage inoculant. Anybody got high moisture corn here? Any reason any high moisture corn? You're probably dry enough. We don't have a lot in Illinois, but you got crooks in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. There's lots of high moisture corn. But that's interesting. Very good. Okay. You got a lot of choices here. I'm not going to walk you through them. Some of these are brand name specific, but basically we look at feed editors and there's eight categories. Now, if you're a really good consultant, veterinarian, nutritionist, you understand all those categories. Energy balance, calcium balance, immune function. Hey kids, guys, that's a new kid in the block. Immune function is gonna get huge because we are gonna use fewer antibiotics and your milk processors are gonna require it and insist on it and we know it's gonna come. It's not all bad, but it's coming, it's coming. Rumen enhancers always have been here. Reproduction, foot health, feed efficiency, and microtoxin binders. So here's your smorgasbord that you can take a look at. What are you gonna look at? Here are the four questions you wanna ask when that feed company, that feed salesman, when your co-op guy comes by, well, how does it work? What's my return? What's the research say? And do I have records on my farm that I can use six months later to say, you know what? That stuff really worked. 
That stuff really worked. If you're missing any one of those four R's, we call it the four R concept, research, return, response, and records, do not mess with the product because you're kind of flying in pretty blindly with that feed attitude. Show me the bucks. That's another theme today. Show me the dollars. I worked it out, benefit to cost ratio, so it says buffers. If I spend six cents on a buffer product, sodium bicarb, Susca carb, not nah, potassium carbonate, that's for heat stress, I should get about 80, I should get about 48 cents back. This is all milk driven. Nothing to do with reproduction, nothing to do with acidosis, and away we go. So you can see uh, buffers eight to one, and you can just come on, zipping on down here, where they go. Room protected choline is three to one because it costs 30 cents a day to put it in. So that really makes it pretty binding. So if you've got that feed additive, make really sure your cows understand the research and make sure you get your four pounds of milk, otherwise you're in deep trouble. So here we go on benefit to cost ratio. What about this research stuff? There's all kinds of them. Uh, this is what uh, you hear at McDonald's. So when you're sitting down at McDonald's and drinking coffee, just about everybody now in Illinois drinks coffee at McDonald's, farmers included, because all the cafes have closed in these small towns. It's kind of sad, isn't it? So if you go to McDonald's, get ready. You might see a lot of cars at McDonald's, and most of them are drinking coffee. Anyway, so the, the, this is the, the weakest one. It says, John says, John! John says, boy, I fed product Z, and that stuff really worked in my farm. Bill, you better try it. Oh, you go. And of course, here is the real winner right up here. This is called peer-reviewed, which means that's it's been published in a journal. That's an important question to ask. And some third party looked at it and said, yep, the work is pretty well done. Pretty well done, works well. What's the problem? Well, you come to Illinois, Wisconsin, probably UT as well, and if you want to do a 40 cow study for a year, get your checkbook out, it's probably going to run 40 or $50,000. Because we're going to support these grad students and their tuition, their labs, you know, and their professors, and, and it, it's just expensive work, expensive work. So this gets pretty pricey. So lots of research out there. I'm going to show you two tools. Again, here we go. Ask for these. This one looks pretty scary. I'm going to show you an example. This, is a, this basically is statistical analysis of research. And this says I'm going to look at all these piles of research and come down to the bottom line. So here we go. Buy card. There are four choices on your dairy farm. The first choice is I'm going to feed buy carb and your cows figure it out. I'm going to make money on it. Another choice you have is I'm not going to feed that stuff. Budgets are tight. My cows wouldn't have figured it out anyway. Remember that guy who asked about 100% corn size based diet? You will feed bicarb. And you will feed a bunch of it. You will feed bicarb to keep everything honest out there. Of course, you got, if you're Dutch, you got another choice. You can say, I'm going to feed bicarb and my cows in Tennessee can't figure that out. And of course, you can say, I'm a Dutchman. I'm not going to feed that stuff, but I would have made some money. Well, everybody can figure that out. But what does the research say? That air. That'll cost you a nickel a day. Pretty much cost the product. This will cost you 30 cents a day. So the question is, that is the risk you take. And remember, you're a dairy farmer. Every day, every month, every year, you take risks. Planting crops, getting cows pregnant, mastitis, cold weather, whatever the case is going to be. That's a pretty good ratio. That's a really good ratio. Pretty good bet, as we would say. Here shows you a meta-analysis. This comes from our Canadian co colleagues up at Guelph. And you can see 36 papers published, 71 trials, 10,000 cows. And those 10,000 cows would say, you guys in Tennessee, you're going to see a de slight decrease in dry matter intake, an increase in milk production, butterfat tests may go down slightly, protein uh, stays the same, feed efficiencies improve, and milk composition changes slightly. That's what your cows are going to do. The good news on Remenzen, it's going to cost you about three or four cents a day. And you may see less ketosis, fewer DAs. Less breakdown of protein. There's a lot of other things that goes on in Remenzen. That's why I'm challenging you with that question there. Now, I can get this to Liz if she wants it. We have a paper that's about a year and a half old. And it lists all the feed additives that you could buy on your farm, including for calves, on these six categories. How do they function? What level? What's the cost? Benefit cost ratio strategy? When should you use it? You break down, you should use it to break into four different categories recommended, experimental, which means, boy, 
pretty cool stuff. Enzymes kind of fall in that category. Kind of cool stuff that we have no idea. Probiotics fit in that category. Evaluative says, you know what? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. You're kind of on your own. And the last one is, ah, we would use it and we're missing one of the R's. So here shows Remenzin. And I just show it to you. That's, that, that's how the, it comes out of the paper. So it's a, we call it quick and dirty. It's in the new uh, feeding guide. A couple of you said you got the new feeding guide. It sits in there as well. Here sits Remenzin. You can read the, the function, the level, the cost, benefit cost ratio, feed strategy, status. I put this in highlight because most of you here are feeding 300 milligrams. How many know how many milligrams of Remenzin you're, oh, who's feeding Remenzin? Start with, show ahead. Who's feeding Remenzin? How many know how many milligrams you're feeding? How many milligrams per cow per day are you feeding? Well, there's a take home message. You maybe need to ask the feed co-op and find what's that answer. Because a new research will say, and, and, and fresh cows, really like each cow, 450. And there's a colleague of mine in Indiana, he's at 600. Ugh. He's on his own on that one. He's legal. He won't go to jail, but he's right at the edge there. You're right at the edge. So we have bumped that number up just a little bit. How much are your dry cows getting? Should be around 300 milligrams per head per day. How much are your calves and heifers getting? Maybe slightly lower numbers. So there's another take home message. Are you feeding enough? And the same thing applies to all these other additives. Are you getting the recommended amounts to have the impact on the rumen, the digestive tract, immune system, mammary gland, wherever, wherever we're going? And so here we go. Here we go. And this is probably the most important part of the talk. It says, well, which ones? You get to do this every month with your feed company. So you kind of had to get a cow's perspective on it, see what it would look like from the cow's perspective. This slide makes me really nervous, Jeffrey, because if that my colleague could put that in the front end, he could also put it on another end of that cow too, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, leave, it, we'll leave it at that. You got a little problem with particle size in the feed bunk too. So here we go. You got it in your handout. So if I were working with you and I was your nutritionist, this is what I'd recommend. I'd recommend a rune buffer, a yeast culture, yeast product, monenzin, which is the ger generic name for rumenzin. We always say rumenzin because most of my dairymen wouldn't recognize monenzin, but same thing. We use rumenzin versus lasalicin because rumenzin is cleared for lactating cows. It is not cleared, lasalicin is not cleared for that. Silage inoculants, biotin, and organic trace minerals. Those would be my six. A dairyman, he'll be at our dairy days in two weeks from now. Don always comes. That cost him 32 cents last year. Not only did he know how much he was feeding, but he knew what it was costing him, 32 cents. It'll be interesting this year to talk to Don and say if Marcella shut him down. Said, no, I'm not gonna feed all that stuff. We're gonna put 32 cents a day into my cow. We're out in, uh, in New Mexico where they had a water additioned additive feeder in and his cost was about 34 cents a cow a day. And he was putting them all in as well. Different ways to do it. Now, here comes the question. Well, Mike, if I go home with this, my wife's gonna shoot me. May not be all bad, but uh, anyway, uh, priorities. These are my priorities. I got rumenzin number one, and we can argue in the Q&A if there's a reason why it's number one, but to me, if you're not feeding your menzin to heifers and dry cows and milk cows, knock on the door with your feed co-op and figure out, get it in. I almost guarantee you're gonna be in good shape. I got size inoculants, sec. Well, why is rumenzin number one? Well, here's kind of a dicey one. How many know what, what is rumenzin? What is it? It is a what? An antibiotic. So when you feed rumenzin to your cows, it slows down the fiber digesting bacteria. And that may also be, explain why butterfat tests go down slightly out there in the feeding program. Because I've got some, uh, a couple of Jersey herds, and I won't touch it with an input pole, because every time they fed it, went into the butterfat test. Three tenths of a point down. I call that the canary in the mine. There's something else going on on that farm. Rumenzin just, just intensifies whatever's wrong. Too much unsaturated fatty acids, not enough physical fiber, too much starch. I, Republicans, I have no idea what it is. We move on. But I cannot mimic that antibody. Now, what's the really good news for your dairyman? Well, the bad news, if you go see your doctor with your cold this weekend, he tells you you take something from Rumenzin. You gotta get a different doctor. It has no, it has no biological function in a human. It never gets across the rumen wall. Therefore, it never pops up in milk. 
So therefore, it is never, it should never be pulled. Although there was a company in Oregon selling what? Milk labeled being fermenting free. Trust me, Elanco got on that sucker really fast. Really fast. New Zealand cows almost all get rumenzin. Do you know why? Bloat, bloat control. Great product to control bloat on pasture cattle. So if you want to get nasty with your New Zealander friends, you're saying, well, all you guys feed antibiotics to your cows and therefore you shouldn't buy product. China shouldn't buy your product. We'll leave it at that. Side inoculant is number two. Pretty good deal. Most of you are going to be putting in product anywhere from $68 to $3 a ton on silage. Really good return. You saw it at 3 to 1. If you take the nutrients that you've saved in that 3 to 1 and you put it through a good Jersey or Holstein, it becomes 8 to 1. That's the only reason. I, I hope that's the only reason you're milking cows. You can take more money taking your crop and put it through your cow than sell it on the market. And I got about, I'm guessing in Illinois, we got about 15, 20% of our dairymen should get in that business right now. Get rid of the damn cows. They're not making any money. All they're doing is producing surplus milk, and in most cases, marginal quality milk on top of it. Number three, and the reason I do inoculant is because I want to drive and control the fermentation. Especially some of you folks are chopping in November and December in, Georgia, in uh, Tennessee, because I'm not going to have the bacteria there to try to make that fermentation go. Organic trace minerals. And here's a new kid on the block, block. chromium. Chromium, new trace mineral. We're pretty much out on the edge on this one. Only one company in the United States, Kemen, can sell it. It's been cleared by FDA, but it really has some neat things to do in transition cows. Anybody here feeding chromium to transition cows, close-up cows, fresh cows? If you got those pens, write that sucker down. It's going to cost you about four or five cents to add that to the other ones, as far as that goes. Yeast culture and bicarb go down here now. You're saying, Hutchins, why is bicarb fifth? Everybody in the United States is feeding that. And the answer is, you can work the ration that you can get enough cud chewing and ration management, you can maybe work your way out of it. That's why you got a little bit of straw in that diet. Just keep that rumen honest. A more buffer being produced. So I, I can maybe work my diets. I can get away from that. And biotin, another talk for another day, but... Uh, it's got some benefits on hoof control. But remember, I'm Dutch. In Wisconsin, Ohio State did the research, and you get four pounds more milk for about four cents. Wow, four pounds of milk. Maybe some stronger hoof, hoof health. Guess I'll take that all day to the bank. So anyway, that, that's my order. And this does come up two years ago on a dairy day. My, my fifth best dairyman in the state said, Mike, I can't feed all six of them. What's your order? And so you may have that same challenge where you live and work as well. Here comes my dry cows. The list changes a little bit. Obviously, the first three are still there. Really important to me, that's important because that one is, the reason I, I'm a big fan of organic trace minerals, and there's six or eight of them in the, in the marketplace. We're talking organic selenium, organic zinc, chromium, copper especially, those four. Immunity, health, and hoof. Probably not going to get you any more milk. But you and I both know that I can get your cows pregnant 10 days quicker, or have lower somatic cell count, or healthier hooves. You'll, you'll get that money back. You'll get that money back. So take a look at this chromium. To me, I'm impressed with the data. The word is a new NRC will be out sometime late this year, 2019, according to Dr. Bill Weiss. That or he said he'll commit suicide, but anyway, I think he's kidding. But supposedly it should be out. And it'll be interesting to see what they do with chromium, organic trace minerals and uh, amino acids, and then anionic product. How many here are feeding an anionic product to their cows? Could be uh, animate, could be biochlor, could be soy chlor, could be the new zeolite product out there, creating a lot of interest. A zeolite is a binder, and it tends to bind the calcium. And um, there's some good research out of Cornell that looks good, but we discovered, Cornell discovered, not only does it bind calcium, it binds magnesium, it binds phosphorus, and it may bind some other things as well. And it'll cost you $2 plus a day for the cow. And you gotta feed over a pound of it, and that takes another pound of dry matter, space, in the close-up ration. So that one is an interesting product. The, the two uh, meetings I was at, 
Those farmers on it were pretty positive, pretty positive. But my question is, if it ties up calcium and magnesium, might it tie up zinc and selenium and some other things? I don't know. You're on your own there. But this, this is a, a really neat approach, depending on what your decad on your rations look like. Let's go to our fresh cows. And here's my list again of fresh cows. A lot of them pop up here. This is an interesting one. How many here are using the boluses? Who's bolusing cows right here? Boy, you guys like it? We just hear lots of good things from my farmers who are using the calcium boluses right at calving, right at calving. How many are bolusing 12 hours later? Anybody bolusing 12 hours later? Got one or two hands going up because that bolus is going to be gone in about four to six hours. That calcium is gone. She's utilized it. She's metabolized it. She's excreted. Uh, she's voted for Trump. I have no idea what she did with it, but anyway, it's gone. And my dad, bless his soul, he could look at a cow and says, you know, this cow is going to go have milk fever, and we wouldn't wait for her to go down. He would call the vet, just go in and treat that cow, because he wouldn't wait for that cow to go down. He could see that. I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. Anyway, now, those six or eight of you raise your hands on boluses. How many grams of calcium is your bolus delivering in your bolus or boluses? Should be between 15 and 60 grams of calcium. Number two, what is the source of calcium? The winners are calcium propionate, calcium sulfate, calcium chloride. They are biologically more available. I'm Dutch. You want to buy my belt? You want to buy my bolus for a buck or for eight bucks? I'm going to use limestone because it is seven cents a pound. I can make my bolus. It's pretty cheap. I can make a lot of bucks on you guys as well. We're at a farm supply company a couple of years ago, and here we go, and the, the guy and, and the guy and the package says four boluses. Got to give them four bol. Why four boluses? Because they're smaller. They're much easier to administer. But five grams per bolus. Ding ding ding. So eyes wide open. Eyes are open. Expo last year. If you're up there, a number of companies were, fell, were selling boluses, including some of my AI companies are now selling them as well. So eyes wide open with the added calcium as far as that goes out there in the program. I got this as my as needed list, and we're in pretty good shape. We've got, what, you got five minutes left? Holy smokers, we've got a lot of questions. We're in big trouble here. Anyway, Hutch's ad needed list here. These are my drenchers. Who's drenching the propylene glycol at calving? Got some hands going up. Who are using the, uh, the strips, test strips to test, check the blood at three to 10 to 12 days after calving? That's pretty neat technology. That's a lot of labor. I understand that. But it's, uh, it's a neat approach as far as that goes. What's going to be the good news here? Supposedly, the next year or two, we're going to have calcium strips. You can take a blood sample on the tail of your cow and check it right there to see if she's at 8 milligrams or 6 milligrams or 10 milligrams, which gives you a little idea how your transition cow is working. That, that technology, I know there's a group in Canada, a group in Europe that's working on it. There's a group in, J in Japan working on it. But they were running into some problems, I understand, last year, but away we go. So again, these are as needed. So if you want to drench cows, to me, th that is the product you're going to be looking at, uh, propylene glycol, uh, calcium propionate. If I'm going to drench, I'm going to drench a pound. She might eat this. She might. And the stuff's pretty unpalatable. Have you ever smelt it or tasted it? I do taste feed. Trust me, taste urea and or taste calcium chloride, and you will stop tasting feeds immediately because those are really mean dudes as far as that goes. Anyway, these are niacin for heavy cows. And notice now we have two or three companies that are making rumen protected. Niacin is a B vitamin, and the data is clear. Rumen bacteria go nuts on niacin. They break it down. About 75% is broken down in the rumen. So we're looking at some being protected. Here, and we're going to touch on those in just a minute here. We have time to do that. Rumen protected choline, especially for heavier cows that really tend to lose weight and lactation. The ionic salts, depending on your decad. And then some of your uh, propionic acid, acetic acid, bale, uh, bale preservatives or for high moisture corn. So again, this is kind of on the list. Here are some things to watch. I don't know if you heard much about essential oils. Once in a while, you'll see an article in Progressive Dairyman or, and or or dairyman on essential oils. It's all coming from Europe. And it's coming from Europe because what's not legal in Europe? Rumenza. The essential oils, what do you mean essential oil? Garlic, uh, pine tree oil. Um, the, there's some 20 different oils out there. 
that are being made commercially as far as that goes. And so it replaces rumenzin in terms of feed efficiency and methane reduction. Why do we use that in the United States? Well, that's going to cost you six or eight or 10 cents a cow a day. Rumenzin is going to cost you three cents. I'm back. I'm a cheapskate. I'm Dutch again. And so I got a cheaper alternative to accomplish a similar thing. DFMs, we may touch it here. Or probiotics. You saw 11, 12% of my farmers survey were feeding that. And then feed enzymes. There's lots of interest in that, especially in the poultry and pig and also in ethanol plants. But you have a rumen, and some of these will be fiber digesters, and those are winners. And there's at least one side inoculant, maybe two in the company, on the market, that has an enzyme in their inoculant that breaks down fiber. And that would be a winner. That would be a winner. If an amylase breakdown, your cows do a pretty good job of that. Your cows should be able to handle that. If you've got the corn and the barley processed right and your kernel processor is working correctly, we should be in pretty good shape. So find out what are they breaking down. Because many of these enzymes are from pigs and they're looking to break down starch and protein. And I'm not sure you want to do that in a dairy cow out there in the program. Okay, let's wrap up with a couple of feed additive updates. First, we want to talk about quickly because of a conversation I had about, uh, about three weeks ago with a person down in the southeastern part of the United States, signs of microtoxins. Microtoxins are produced by moles. So if you get mold development, they'll produce microtoxins and they can do some really evil things. The thing that really scares me is this one here, immune suppression. And that's a huge factor when we get in our dry cows and fresh cows because they are already immune suppressed because of hormonal changes that are going on. So eyes wide open on that one here. Hormonal factors, and this one scares me because I've asked, been asked four times and I cannot answer it. We have cows calving in that don't bag up. I have no idea. It probably is a hormonal prolactin linked problem, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And that always frustrates me when you end up talking to the farmer on the phone and says, I don't know. Of course, you never let it there. You look at what feeds they have and maybe make a few feed changes, get some of the silages out and see if it goes away. But you can see a lot of these things can happen normally on a dairy farm. These are the numbers that we are looking at. These are the, what we call the big four. You know, all tech tests for more of them. But Don, vomitoxin, aflatoxin, T2, and that's a scary one from our perspective right here, and xerolinone. This is in the total ration dry matter. So remember that when you look at my slide. So if your corn size is hot, meaning it's elevated, remember, you're probably going to dilute that out with forages, other forages, grains, and stuff like that. This is total ration. This comes from very specific research studies, and I hear the Alltech people telling me, and I don't disagree with that at all, simply saying if you got one of these, there's a pretty good chance you can have more than one, and so suddenly now it becomes additive in terms of risk to the cow. So there's the numbers. What I do is I go to Dairyland Labs and Rock River in Wisconsin and say, what are you folks seeing? Because they will get samples that are suspect sent to them. Of course, that's a biased sample. But I wonder what they're seeing. What kind of numbers are they seeing? How much sampling damage are the risks are we assuming at this stage of the game? I go to them because this is going to probably cost you $60 to $100 to get a feed tested. And it all depends on how accurate your sample is. And if you do a TMR, I think, wow, you are really got a lot of faith in God. Because now I'm mixing all of them together. So how good is your job of mixing, weighing, all that kind of stuff going in? And so I would not test a TMR. One of my colleagues said he would. I would not. I would test the feed I'm suspicious of, in this case, corn silage, to see, in fact, if the number is modestly high. you got basically uh, the two products out there, as I see. One called a clay-based product. There says your betonite. There's that zeolite that we talked about tying up calcium with, calcium aluminosilicates. That's a Novacil product. And you're going to feed about this level of those cows. It ties up aflatoxin. It's not there, but that's what ties up aflatoxin. Don't think that's your problem this year in Georgia or northern Illinois or southern Wisconsin where all the rain was when we were trying to harvest corn sides and we couldn't get it out. You're down here. You're looking against these guys, what I call the cold weather. This is drought, stressed, hot weather, risk. This one is wet, cold, delayed harvest, late season. And these are these guys. And I'd be looking at a yeast cell extract also known as beta-glucans, mannosaccharides, and moss. You'll find that on the, on the list. 
I stress that because you want to be sure you have the right product. Some of the companies will put both of them together. So they're going to cover both bases as far as that goes. So combination of products. We saw some new research with the algae, an algae fiber source that looked pretty good. And a couple companies from Europe are selling an enzyme that breaks down the, the ring structure of the aflatoxin. The only problem is these are very specific to the aflatoxin or the microtoxin, I should say. So there's a real question of the, how, if, if, if the enzyme is going to work on your farm under your conditions. Here is my bacteria inoculant slide. Didn't think we'd get to it, but we did get to it. I will stop a bit early because I started a bit early on you as well. You've been sitting there now for almost two hours. That's a no-no. I tell you, I'm programmed to go 45 minutes and students are programmed to go 40. They're about done listening. Last five minutes, you don't want to cover anything important. Thiage inoculant, bacteria inoculants, we're talking about specifically here. That's how they function. This comes right off that sheet again that I will certainly get to Liz uh, in case you want to look at that big monster sheet or buy the new Hordes Dairyman Feed Guide. It's in there as well. Here you can see uh, the cost, the ratio. We recommend it. Here's another one right down. How many are doing a fermentation profile on their silages on the farm right now? Write that sucker down. Got a couple hands goes up. It answers the question, did you do a good job of preserving the feed that was raised on your farm? You're going to forage test to say where the, if the fibers are and the proteins, all that kind of good stuff. This one says, did you pack it? Did you inoculate it? Did it ferment quickly? Did you lose very little dry matter? And here we go. So let's come down. Come Here it says corn silage. Here's the dry matters. Some of you here in the room are going to be a little drier this year because you couldn't get it out on time. Here's the pH should be, percent lactic acid, acetic acid. You don't want any of this crap there. You don't want any of this stuff here as well. But these are important numbers down here. So how good a job did you do? One farmer did it two years ago, came back to another meeting and said, Mike, that was a waste of 20 bucks. Came back just what it was supposed to be. I'm saying, well, what do you mean waste? That's good news. Whatever you did, however you, whatever silage cover you were using, whatever inoculant you used, however you chopped it, do it again next year. Do it again next year because you really did a good job of getting this done. Let's just give you a, just a quick taste of this. You've got a lot more slides here. I promise I'm going to stop and see if we have any questions. I haven't let you in uh, at any point for questions. DFMs, direct, direct fed microbials. These are live bacteria. Here they are. Here's a summary of ones you can buy. There's my first problem. Which one or two are the right guys? How many do I have to feed? Don't have that answer either. I've got both of this on silage. If you go back, there it is. These are the good guys. That's come from USDA Forge Lab in Madison, Wisconsin, and tells you how many units, colony form units you have. Pretty powerful, isn't it? You ever look at your bag to see if you get the good guys? And of course, this is the one you want for high moisture corn, the, uh, the, the uh, lactobacillus buchneri. And of course, sure enough, it's not listed there. Anyway, for high moisture corn and corn silage, I'd be looking very strongly at that. Several companies sell the lactobacillus of Buchneri, B-U-C-H-N-E-R-I. I wouldn't use an alfalfa because it's primarily for high starch feedstuffs as far as that goes. So here they are. That's how it's supposed to work. Lehman Kong, Dr. Kong, University of Delaware, when did I did a survey and said these are this is the data he could find. This data now is about four years old. So there could be newer stuff out there, but this is all he could find, research driven data. I went back to Horst Derman's survey and look at this, guys and gals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven different products out there that farmers are using in the United States. And a couple of these I can see are sold by AI companies. And uh, there were other products that were too numerous to list here, but lots of choices out there for you dairy farmers. How does it work? Well, it can work in the rumen, it can work in the small intestine, and it can work in the large intestine. And that is where a lot of the activity is being looked at right now, especially on baby calves. We are recommending a research DFM to calves on milk, milk replacer, and calf starter, period. Who's feeding a DFM to their milk-fed calves? Show of hands. Anybody feeding DFMs, milk-fed calves? If you got a milk replacer, you might discover on the bag you are feeding them, which would be 
good news as long as the, the boogers are alive, as far as that goes. How do they work? Well, they work in the digestive tract either by, by, by protecting the lining or, and or by providing something that inhibits the bacteria. But here's the home run. Here's where you're going to get some real effect, and it's all in your handout. You can read this here. You can either uh, look at uh, competing so the bad guys can't adhere to the intestinal lining, stimulate the immunity. I mean, that's a huge one right there. As far as that goes, get, get these bad guys out of here and avoid what we call leaky gut. And if you ever hear Chance from Lance Baumgart from Iowa State, he's a big discussion of leaky gut. This both for calves and for cows. And so that's kind of where they go. Lots of different themes here in terms of what it can do. Rumen, lactic acid production, combination of products. Uh, to me, I think the real fit is right here. It sits right here. And maybe you're like some of those Wisconsin, Illinois dairy farmers. You know what? Guess what they're doing? Three-day-old calves go to Texas to be raised. Three-day-old calves go to Texas. They truck them down there, and they do really well. You say, well, they're all going to die in the truck. The answer no, they don't. 18-hour drive, two drivers, they make her. I would have a DFM and then do it, let me tell you, to make sure that they survive pretty well. So we've got lots of needs for research at this point on the farm. Take-home message, never got that. It was in your booklet from the last talk, but we got there. And I think I'll let you read those. We're going to give you a talk. Some of you may be out at the Reno conference. We're going to give a talk on rumen protected B vitamins. We've been on and got all the research we could find from journals, from tree companies, and uh, looks interesting to me. B vitamins look interesting for transition cows. Transition cows, especially probably baby calves. And with that, I think we are done five minutes early or five minutes late if you decide when I, when I started here. Any questions or comments on this talk or a previous one, this would be a good time to do it. Those of you that uh, need to use the restroom, quick out the door to the right, you'll get there. Comment. Yeah, great. great question up here. I'm a little biased. Question is, what about selenium yeast? On my dry cows, I want 100%. And my milk cows, 50-50. And why 50-50? It's primarily cost. So I'd like to have at least three to four milligrams of organic selenium in there for my, for my transition cows because Bill Weiss says it's 60% more biologic available. Remember, FDA has got you guys clamped down. You can only feed 0.3 parts per million. If I use organic selenium, <laughs> I'm feeding the equivalent probably five, point five. So I'm gonna, that's the reason I'm going to cheat it. Yeah, I, I, what about, I, very few times. Question is botulism. I've, I've been on uh, two, two farms with it, and um, it, it was. How do we know that? Because you could smell it. It was rotten silage. It was rotten silage. And the reason I, that's why I was calling the both farms, and basically I didn't have the horsepower on either farms to say throw it away. My recommendation was to throw it away. Uh, one farmer didn't believe me, so he brought another consultant in and then he was paying him and he did the same thing. He said, if you want to throw that stuff away, then I'm not going to be your consultant as far as that goes. So uh, did, I'm not sure we isolated, but we ran the butyric acid. Butyric acids were up at 2%. So again, uh, usually we run butyric acid on the VFAs on the silage. And if you get over 0.25, Dr. Um, Etzel from Wisconsin says, you're, you're, you're heading the wrong way. So look at that butyric acid level and pH. And both of those sizes are up around six. And if you got a pH six, look out. Kitty bar the door. Kitty bar the door. Great question. You get a cup of coffee as well, maybe two. And they also get the cause? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Wow. What, what a challenging question. Um, is the question is, if, if, is there a difference on forage quality? If I have really super forage quality, which may stress the rumen a little bit, I think that's where you're going. Would probiotics uh, assist that? And my answer is yes, but might not, be, might not be my first choice. I might be looking at a yeast product and or a buffer product there. Or you could say, well, I'm rich. I'm rich. I'm in Tennessee. I'm a rich dairy man. I'll put all three of them in. But the answer is, is, is yes. I think if, 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 if the rumen is, is working well, 
I'm not sure, that, I'm, I'm cautious until I see more data on the probiotic. The yeast, there's data on the yeast and the buffer side of it, but I, I'm not sure. I, I, got, I got my probiotics, put my transition cows, my close up and my, my fresh cow ration and my baby calves, I think, it's, I think it's there. And which product, you're on your own on that one. You're on your own, or we can talk later, but anyway, enough said, enough said. Does that make sense to you? I'm not sure you have to agree with me, but you know, the, if you had a really smoking forage, and I think that's been one of the questions with the BMR corn. I think somebody raised his hand over here and BMR, uh, BMR, uh, low, uh, BMR corn silage and low lignin alfalfa. He's smoking, man. He is really smoking. But again, with low lignin alfalfa, you got different strategies. You can cut it a week later and 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 still have high quality, but a little different. So the so the, the low lignin alfalfa gives us some some opportunity. I think you dairymen just if got you grow that alfalfa, you got to put some in just see how you like it. How you, how, how you like it, see how it grows, yield. Doesn't go down like the corn, the corn will go down. And the corn will get all kinds of microtoxins in it. So the word in the Midwest is, if you're feeding BMR, you will spray it. With a fungicide at tasseling stage, you will spray it. You will spray it because for some reason, all the bugs in the county will find you. All the fungi will find you. And they also go to the cause, we're gonna turn it back to our coast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.